Hello. I can hear you now, Lauren. Can you hear me? Hey, I can hear you too. Excellent. Excellent. I should just drag Jonathan into the call, though, too. Drag him in kicking and screaming. He says his Skype is updating, though. So. Oh. Oh, well, he's online now. So let me try dragging him in and seeing if this works. I, meanwhile, am trying to get PayPal to work. I'm having problems with getting it to send money. Yeah. I heard the uh, the bad news. Bummer. Oh, about Luke? Yeah. This, this is technically unrelated to that. Um, but thank you. Yeah. It, ugh. We've spent the last couple of weeks just working on this. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the reasons I decided to skip my church conference because I thought you were getting married that weekend. But we, I, already bought, I already bought my plane ticket, so I figure I'm, in, I'm already in. Yeah. We – so – about a couple of months ago, when or it was like a month and a half, two months ago at this point, we got all of the information together to submit to get an interview, which is literally the last step in this whole process. And all of the information, like we, we were basically given deadlines of July 25th as an expiration date for a lot of the forms that we submitted, which is when we thought, okay, great, you know, we're set because he's got to have the interview by July 25th in order for, because these forms will expire. And the first interview that he gets given is in September. And then he managed to move it back to end of August. And we finally did some digging and he contacted the consulate and they were very nice and everything. And then they were just like, because he said, well, I need to have this interview by July because all my forms uh, expire. And we figured they would give him an interview before July. And what they said was, oh no, we'll just extend the deadline on your forms. Um, apparently there are two slots for interviews for visas in Vancouver a week. And the fact that he even got one in the, in the next month or so is amazing. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I need something that rhymes with gone. That's related to something we would talk to. Like Vaughn. Vaughn. Oh. No, no, Vaughn. Bravo. Bravo. Not, not uh, Victor. I'm too bad. I'm using Victor. I hate you. I'm just posting on the Facebook to let people know that we're live. I actually posted on our Rooster Teeth group for the first time in forever, too. Well, that's good. Hope Maybe it'll get some traffic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to try and get a little more advanced notice. We need to, I need to do a better job of, uh, of signal boosting this. And then just so you guys know, I have a friend actually flying into town tonight and I'm going to need to leave like 20 minutes early uh, because his flight gets in at 8.15. So I need to cut out a little early tonight. No problem. I'm sorry. You have to submit that to, uh, to HR and uh, <laughs> get the form. I mean, that's uh, I, I appreciate your, uh, your difficulty there, but yeah... Yeah, considering I also have to call uh, PayPal and figure out why it won't let me transfer money from my PayPal to my bank, and I just keep getting an internal service error, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't know, like, it, it, all it says is I hit transfer, and it says internal service error, and it just sits there, and I'm like, oh, uh, what? And I can't find anything online, so I'm just going to call them and be like, yo, I need to transfer money. What, what's the deal? What's the deal? What be the deal, yo? In my day, we said, what's the deal, yo? Well, in our day, we were dorks. Were? I like this past tense. Barely. Where are you going with this? <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo. Well, we're live and streaming. So, hi, I'm Jack. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Lauren. And we are Gloop Shark. Tonight, as always, we talk about whatever we want to, as much of whatever we want to talk about, and we are even inclined to take your phone calls, 215-486-2125, or Skype Jenga ship if you have the Skype. Uh, but first, as always, or at the very least as often as we can, we have the lovely, the talented, the amazing Oboe Crazy, here to do a little something that we call This Week in Geek. How are you, Lauren? I am excited. I have a friend coming in from out of town who I have, um, in the grand tradition of friends over the internet, will be meeting for the first time, even though I've played Halo with him and evolved with him for probably about eight years now. So 
I am excited. But first, let's talk about other geeky things. Let's start with Avengers Age of Ultron, because the Blu-ray is being released soon. The actual trailer just came out. It has a whole bunch of features in it. Uh, one of the more interesting tidbits, which I wanted to talk about, including all of the extended scenes and extra funness, is that we finally have confirmation about the Infinity Stone names. There's been a lot of talk about what they actually are, and they've been referenced in the movies in different ways, but there's actually finally legit, this is what they're called. Uh, the home video launch preview confirms the names of the four found cosmic gems as the Scepter's Mind Stone, which was the only thing that was confirmed in any of the movies. Uh, the Tesseract is the Space Stone. The Aether is the Reality Stone. And the Purple Stone from Guardians of the Galaxy was the Power Stone. That means we're only missing officially two stones, the Time Stone and the Soul Stone per the comics, and they haven't been revealed, and we'll probably be getting that soon. Uh, if you do pick up the Blu-ray, it's pretty amazing. It's got 45 minutes of bonus content. It comes with a whole bunch of uh, background features and a whole bunch of uh, scenes that were cut from the original movie. And because on a previous This Week in Geek, we talked about how Joss absolutely despises director's cuts, uh, that's the only way that you're going to see some of the cut features from the movie. So definitely check that out. Uh, you can actually pick it up on Digital 3D, Digital HD, and Dig Disney Movies Anywhere on September 8th. And the 3D Blu-ray Combo Pack Blu-ray and On Demand will be available October 2nd. Next up in a related story, Spider-Man. Now, we already know that the Marvel movies version of Spider-Man is going to be the high school m version of Spider-Man, the younger version. We're all kind of excited about that. Uh, Marvel Comics actually announced this week that its all-new, all-different Marvel initiative, which is launching in the wake of the Secret Wars, will feature Spidey, which is an ongoing series from writer Robbie Thompson and artist Nick Bradshaw that will tell new stories from Peter Parker's earliest days as Spider-Man. Uh, editor ch editor in chief of Marvel, Al Al Alex Alonzo, said, quote, Everyone remembers their first Spider Man comic. Spidey aims to be perfect as someone's first Spider Man comic, or their 1000th. We're not looking to retell stories. We've put together an exciting new take on Spider Man and his arguably most iconic incarnation, and we feel fresh and new for old and new fans alike. Out of the 700-plus issues of The Amazing Spider-Man, Peter Parker was only in high school for 30 issues. Stan and Steve covered a lot, but there's a lot of high school and early superhero experience still on the table. So if you're looking for young, happy, go-lucky, crazy Spider-Man, this is the one for you. And it might actually give you a preview of what we'll see in the movies to come. Finally, on the absolute opposite end of happy-go-lucky Spider-Man, let's talk about the killing joke. Yeah. So you remember a while ago, Mark Hamill retired from being the Joker and then other people have been the Joker and everyone just keeps going, God, I wish Mark Hamill was still the Joker, even though these other people have been pretty damn awesome. Yet Mark Hamill has officially signed on to voice the Joker in Batman's The Killing Joke, which is kind of amazing. Uh, Collider confirmed that Hamill ha uh, will be returning for both... Um, Let's see. I think he's just doing the movie. Yeah. According to Hamill, uh, the project had already wrapped and his voice work was done when the project was actually announced at Comic-Con. So Warner Brothers is basically just finishing animation on its way towards a release next year. If you're not familiar with The Killing Joke, then why are you listening to this podcast? Because you need to go and read The Killing Joke. It's very, very not PG-13 and the absolute opposite of the Spider-Man we were just talking about. But it is highly considered one of the best, I'd say, Batman stories of all time and definitely up there with what people think of as a comic book story of all time. So uh, I'm happy because I think Mark Hamill is awesome. And while the other people who have played the Joker so far have had their own fun takes and have been good in their own right, I think a lot of us have a soft spot in our heart. For Mr. Hamill. That's all for this week in Geek. I'm Obo Crazy, and I will be watching that movie. I don't know about you guys. Most deaf.
Mark Hamill is the Joker. I mean, I saw, you ever see those internet memes where one person brags, another person says, oh, that's cute, I did this. And the other person says, oh, that really? I did that. And then finally, the last image is like, just sort of like shuts down all conversation, right? So I saw one similar where it was the Jokers, and you had uh, Cesar Romero was a clown, and then another, and then I think it was um, Jack Nicholson as a gangster, and then, what's it? Uh, uh, Heath Ledger Heath as the anarchist. anarchist. And yeah. then uh, the new one, the new guy, uh, Jared, Jared Leto as a punk or something. <laughs> no, as the uh, psychopath. Psychopath, right. And then finally there's a picture of Mark Hamill and it just says the Joker. Yeah. So, yes. yeah, I'm They've definitely They've all excited. been excellent, but I think, I, I think for a lot of us, the Mark Hamill version is kind of the, the definitive version. And to do the killing joke without him, I think with him on, it gives a lot more credence than being able to do that right. Credibility, yeah. You can't, I can't think of another voice actor who's come even close to performance. And the Joker's a hard character to do. And there are yeah. other people who had interesting takes on it, but Mark Hamill stands head and shoulder above the rest. But hey, the, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but hey, the world is indeed a strange place. If you have a fact you want read live and on the air, say for instance a teenage Spidey fighting the Joker using an Infinity Gem. You can send it to Lauren at obocrazy.com. And while you're at it, go to our website, which is glibshark.com, full of uh, past episodes of our shows and other kinds of content, glibshark.com, the house of all our content. So I have a very important question to ask you two. Yes? What are you drinking? Yeah. At the moment, I'm just drinking iced tea because shortly I have to get in a car and drive places. Boo. Yeah, I'm not drinking anything tonight. Gosh. I know what I wish I was drinking and I, what I might be drinking later, but at the moment, yeah, I, there is driving still in my future. Well, be that as it may, um, I'm kind of disappointed with my drink, to be honest, so probably just as well that I'm the only one who's partaking. I took some almond milk and some honey, Turkish honey, and I didn't have my uh, standby. I think usually I was using uh, bourbon in here, but I didn't have any bourbon, so I had vodka. And everyone knows that if bourbon is Ron Swanson, then, then vodka is like uh, John Ralphio, right? It is the John Ralphio of spirits. So I don't know. Vodka, you can kind of put in anything. That's true. I mean, for a Moscow Mule, which is what I bought it for, it's great. But it's not – I generally prefer a darker liquor. I, I, I love the versatility of a good vodka. I've also – one of my favorite alcoholic beverages would be the, the Van Gogh flavored vodkas. There's a, uh, a cappuccino that is absolutely outstanding. So it's, it's hard for me not to want to go for a good vodka. Does it taste like cappuccino? Oh, yes. Wow. Oh, yes. So much so that um, Luke, who does not like coffee at all, does not like it because it, it, is, it is alcoholic cappuccino. Is, wow. But it is like vodka. It. Yeah, that. the van... The Van Gogh series of vodkas um, have been really highly rated. They do the 100-point the scale, and their vodkas, all their flavored vodkas, land 99 or 100. I think that the cappuccino is the 99. They've got a, a coconut that has landed 100 and a couple of others that, that are just absolutely outstanding. They are not cheap, though. So while I highly recommend them, it's not cheap vodka. It's top-shelf shit. <laughs> that sounds like about my speed. Mm. Oh yeah, if you ever can get your hands, uh, they're they're tall, thin, really neatly neat looking bottles. Um, the flavors range from the the classics, like uh, there's a chocolate, there's a vanilla, there's the coconut, and then the last time I looked, they'd come out with like a peanut butter and jelly. Um, I think I saw a cotton candy, like really the stuff that you're like, okay, wait, this should be in a $10 bottle of vodka. What the hell? But they're so good. They're just so amazing. I will say vodka is versatile. And if there was a spirit you could do that with, I would say vodka could be the one to do it with. You couldn't really do that with, uh, with a bourbon or a rye or, or, or most whiskeys, but yeah. vodka sort of takes on the form of the things. Like, it's like, maybe it's not the John Ralphio of, uh, of liquors. It's maybe it's the tofu. Of, of liquors and that it assumes the flavor and the form of whatever's around it or ditto if you will i i don't know if i've ever thought of vodka and tofu in the same sentence but i see where you're going my that's what my mind does it just connects things uh, in, in a bizarre kind of random way you should see the schema in my mind mm. uh, but i i had a question i wanted to bring up or just i don't know if you heard about this or not but i heard a, a rumor and that's all it is at this point that uh that channing tatum is walking away from the gambit project Oh, 
I had not heard that. So that that must be maybe it's an unconfirmed rumor. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, I mean, I think he'd actually do pretty good. I mean, he has that southern heritage. I think he grew up in uh, in Mississippi or or Louisiana or something. So he knows the culture. And, you know, ladies, he's Channing Tatum, so. (laughs) I I had no overt problems with him being in the role. Did the rumor specify why? Well, I looked at it. I I forget what the website was. I should be citing my sources and showing my work as a professional podcaster here, right? But uh, apparently he had an issue with the role or was adapting or changing in a certain way. And I can't help but think of the, uh, the BoJack Horseman season two, and not to spoil it too much, but his, uh, his, his project goes in a different direction in, in a way that only network executives could take it. So I don't know if that's true for, uh, for Gambit or not, but I would think with their, uh, their, their momentum going into the uh, X-Men Apocalypse and, and Deadpool and all those other films that they'd want to try and keep that in slate and keep him happy by any means necessary. Okay. But, uh, but I'm I've... disappointed, I mean, because Gambit's one of those guys where I feel like he's best used in small doses as an occasional antagonist or a middle-of-the-line character. I thought, and I said this before on this broadcast, but X-Men Evolution used Gambit to great effect. You didn't see too much of him, and he seemed cool. But when you have Gambit, all, it's all Gambit all the time, it's, it's like, it's terrible and bad, and I don't want all Gambit all the time. Okay, so the news, I just did some very fast Google searching. The news is coming out of uh, therap.com. Um, Channing Tame's Gambit deal is in jeopardy of falling apart as he's planning on having an advertisement interrupt me in the middle of a thing. God, there we go. <laughs> um, as he's planning to exit the comic book project as 20th Century Fox, an individual with knowledge of the situation is told the rap. The studio has been in the process of tex- testing young actresses to star alongside Tatum. Uh, but insiders suggest that director Rupert Wyatt will soon have to find a new leading man. Um, uh, no one could be reached for comment. One individual close to the project told the rep that Tatum's reps are still in active discussions with the studio, but acknowledges that, quote, something is up. Uh, what's weird about it is that this is like Channing Tatum's passion project. Right. Like, He's the reason, he's one of the reasons this was going to happen. Uh, And he actually just appeared at Comic-Con to hype it. Uh, Yeah, that's all the information that I can see. It's all being listed as rumor. It's all being listed as, you know, this, that, and the other. The fact that this is his passion project, that the movie is being made because he and Rupert Wyatt got together and said, we want to do this, and... As far as I know, Fox has a, a date for release already in 2016. So, I don't know. Well, hopefully this That's is weird. like a Harry Shearer situation where maybe there's some, some difficulties in the negotiations and they'll be able to, uh, to sort it out. Interesting that Harry Shearer's negotiations were also with 20th Century Fox. <laughs> what is it about that company that, you know, it's like they snatched defeat from the jaws of victory many, many times. Yeah. Uh, what could be so bad about the project or what they're trying to do that would make Channing Tatum think twice? Is it like Gambit becomes uh, sort of the, uh, the headmaster of an orphanage? And it's like, Gambit love all these orphans. I guarantee this- this could also be just backroom dealing to get more money. I mean, this could be... I mean, the Harry Shearer thing wasn't even a rumor. That was fully announced, and it was, it was fact. Sure. And then uh, 20th Century Fox backed up a giant dump truck full of, filled with money, and suddenly it wasn't true anymore. So for all we know, this is, this is a slightly more sly way of playing this game, putting out the rumors there that he's not as interested in the project anymore or that he might leave. Or, you know, There's no reasons. There's just rumors. So who knows? Jonathan, do you know? I'm going to be honest, and it's one of the reasons why I've been so quiet during all this. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I seriously don't give a fuck. Yeah, you're not a big fan anymore. of him. Well, no, 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 no. I like Channing Tatum. I, I actually just saw oh, okay. the end the other day. I, I like Channing Tatum. I think he's, he's a good actor. He's cool. He's a lot of fun. But I just don't give a fuck about the X-Men projects right now. I, I don't care that they're sharing a universe with the Fantastic Four. I don't care that, that, uh, that the project might be on hold. 
I, I just don't give a fuck. So even yeah. Deadpool? Deadpool. I don't know uh, if Deadpool's considered X Men because he of, is. If, it is. It is. He is it. It's in yeah, that same he's, universe. He's part of that shared universe. Yeah. They okay. actually did say that he uh, he would probably show up in one in whatever combined X Men uh, X Men uh, uh, Fantastic Four. Uh, uh, what's it? Deadpool movie. So it, it, I just I don't know. It's it's tough to get excited about it and. I'm not exactly sure why. I mean, I loved Age of Ultron, obviously. I mean, that was that was good times. And I I, I don't know what, what it is with the 20th Century Fox Marvel outings that I'm just not excited about at all. On the balance, they haven't been as good as their MCU counterparts. But uh, recently, they've redeemed themselves a bit. Uh, I guess Days of Future Past was really good. The Wolverine was solid. The Wolverine was okay, and, and so was Days of Future Past. I know, I know you really like it, Jack, but I was, I kind of had a middling opinion of it, uh, honestly. I mean, especially coming off First Class, First Class was so good, and and Days of Future Past just wasn't as strong. And uh, it, it, it was sort of like I was watching Days of Future Past. I was like, man, they really want me to think this is cool. So it's, I feel like they were trying too hard. Yeah, you know, and I'm kicking myself now. A year after the Hobbit movies come to an end, I never thought to call it Middling Earth. <laughs> oh, <laughs> opportunities missed. I, hopefully, see, hopefully uh, there, I, I am actually making a reference, another inside joke that only certain people will get to the, with the word middling. So hopefully, they, uh, they're, li- hopefully they're listening and they, they get the joke. Ha, ha, and ha. if you do, tweet at us at Glibshark. And let us know that you got it. Maybe even make an oblique reference back. Hey. And that's just one of the few times where a pun that I made gets a legit laugh. So bravo, Jenga. Pat on the back. And, you know, Roblox, now that I think about it, I, I kind of feel the same way you do. I'm, I am more interested in the X-Men movies from a, a being a geek and liking that property sense. But I have not seen all of the X-Men movies. I've not seen all of the Wolverine movies. As much as I like Hugh Jackman, and I think he does really good every single time, as much as I am a gigantic fan of Patrick Stewart and, um, and someone else whose name I've completely forgotten, who's been Sir playing Ian McKellen. Nikita. Sir Ian McKellen, yep. I, I love the two of them. I love that they've gone off and become best friends and bros and do amazing Twitter things. I, I think that franchise has been filled with really good actors and actresses, and the X-Men have always had a very soft spot in my heart, uh, but really ever since X2 and once they dropped Nightcrawler, I just haven't been able to get back into it. Hmm. Although, it begs the question, uh, Fox has the rights to X-Men and Fantastic Four and has hinted, hinted more than once that the two franchises may converge in a movie or something. And at first I was wondering, why would that be exciting to me? You don't see them interact in the comics all that much. And then it occurred to me, Franklin Richards, the son of Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Woman, is a mutant. And that would be the easiest way to tell that story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but- and Sony is, or not Sony, 20th Century Fox is trying to do in their own smaller way what Marvel and DC are already doing with their giant franchises. I mean, everyone is trying to catch up to Marvel's giant shared universe where you don't have to see all the movies, but seeing all the movies makes it that much more fun. And so you're encouraged, you know, they, they've been trying and X-Men has been popular enough and has had a, a decent slate of movies, some, some incredible ones, some okay ones, and some really piss poor ones that it makes sense for them to want to tie that together, especially if they're trying to encourage people to go see the new Fantastic Four, because uh, there hasn't been a good one of those yet. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a fair point. Although you have to give credit to Marvel, who would have thought that without Spider-Man, X-Men, or the Fantastic Four, they would have built a compelling movie universe that is uh, sort of the most powerful engine in Hollywood right now? Yeah. I was re watching um, a review, not, not really a review, Movie Bob did this thing in where he goes back to older, older quote-unquote movies, and I don't remember exactly what the series is called, but it's... Uh, yes, it's really that good is essentially the series. And it re-examines movies that everyone kind of goes, oh, yeah, that was a really good movie. And 
uh, says, yeah, no, it really was, even all these years later. And he, I recently watched him go through Avengers, the, the first one, and why it's such a good movie. And I'm not going to rehash. It was a whole 60-minute video. It's worth watching. But one of the things that he brought up that I haven't thought of since is you can watch Avengers and not have watched a single other Marvel movie and still get what's going on because of the way the characters are introduced, because of the way that the, the pacing of that story drops important reasons or important things about these characters just before you need to know them without it being pandering. Um, you can go into Avengers having seen nothing else and still completely get what's going on, completely know what these characters are and have a lot of fun with it. And for any of the other properties to be able to do that, you know, either the other Marvel movies like Ant-Man to be able to, to enjoy Ant-Man as a standalone, but also kind of get the little references or to be able to watch any of the X-Men movies or be able to watch, you know, any of the DC stuff that's coming out. That's a high bar to live up to. Hey, make everything tied together, but make it that audiences can watch this and nothing else and still get it. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. And I see that uh, we now have in our live stream the uh, latest shot of the RTX logo. Although, I, okay, so I got to talk about this. My app updated today, the RTX app, which is a fantastic app. If you're going RTX, absolutely update it. But the little icon for RTX for 2015 is something straight out of the, the 90s. Did anyone else notice that? I, uh, I actually haven't seen it yet. It's, it is simple, but it's the, the 2015 is in this electric blue, in this italicized sideways font. And I took one look at that and I went, I had a t-shirt like that in the 90s. I love you, RTX. Give me a break. <laughs> well, it's funny. The, the 90s were 20 to 15 to 25 years ago, right? So what's the rule with retro? Anything that's 20 years old or more is now retro and therefore cool again. So everything old is new again. So by that logic, anything from 1995 should be, for lack of a better word, or phrase, en vogue. Oh. <laughs> yeah, oh. sorry, sorry. But uh, mm. it, it sort of ties into the whole uh, Marvel... Oh, well, it uh, sounds like you need to free your mind. <laughs> and, and then the rest of Glib Shark will follow? Yes. Yes, yeah. I apparently do. It ties uh, into the whole uh, Marvel doing comic covers, alternate covers, where they're actually recreations of old hip-hop like covers, uh, album covers, which I think is kind of neat. It's actually done as a sort of homage because the editor-in-chief, Axel Alonso, is a huge hip-hop fan. So they have different uh, adaptations, Ready to Die and uh, 36 Chambers and, and whatnot. And I thought that was kind of a neat little, neat little touch. But yeah, everything old is new again when it comes to RTX, although we're going to be at RTX. We are going to be at RTX. We Yay. are going to be at RTX. We should make sure we mention this in every broadcast until the event comes, although there's not that many left. There are two. There's this week and next week, and that's it. And then we're in Austin. I'm going to see you guys next week. I know, right? Uh, so excited. I know. All I have to do is get through this one move. I'm actually, Friday I'm moving to a new place. Oh, well. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, As someone who's recently moved, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah I've been packing every, every uh, day after work and then all Friday, Saturday, Sunday I was packing. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll be done by Friday. And then it's off to a new place for me and the missus and, and the dog. Six blocks from here, so I'm still in media. But, uh, but yeah, it's just a pain like, having to leave my place for two years and having to throw out half this stuff and get rid of furniture and, uh, and, and, and pack all these things in. And nobody cares. If you guys are listening to this, uh, bless your hearts. But, uh, but you can associate with that. I mean, anyone who's ever had to move. Mm -hmm. We've all been there. And the summer, you know, there's no good time to move, but the summer kind of sucks sometimes. Yeah, hot and sticky. It's like a, it's like a Def Leppard song. So you're going to need some good relaxation time when we're at RTX. Agreed. I'm not going to have any money, but I will have a lot of time. Hey, I won't have any money either. Yay, we'll be <laughs> poor together. We can be the no money twins. Yeah, this will be the first RTX that I've ever been to that I will have basically nothing but free time. Because uh, for those of you that don't, don't know, um, I am the reason that Luke can't go to RTX. Yeah, Luke McKay is not going to RTX. Because we decided we wanted to live in the same country and get married 
and his visa isn't ready yet and he can't be in America until his visa is ready. So he can't go to RTX. So I don't have anyone to booth babe for. So I, I get to basically hang out all RTX, yay? Yeah. Well, on the, yeah. On the, I mean, as far as reasons to miss RTX, I would say true love is a pretty good one. And love... Whoa! What? No, it's it's less it's less true love and more governments suck. Right. So, so yeah, technically, te- I mean, I know, kind of realistically, it's not really my fault. Technically, it is. So, if you are upset that Luke McKay is not going to be at RTX this year, come find me, and come yell at me. I will take it. Or yell at the State Department. They're the ones who are really at fault here. It it's not even really their fault because it's not like like this is just the way that the that the visa process works and it's just it just sucks without having to get into all kinds of visa stuff which nobody needs to know about and i don't really feel like getting into yeah but i will be at rtx i will still be running the glib shark dnd game i also be at the glib shark panel i will not be standing next to luke hawking his wares i'm gonna have a lot of free time and no money so come and yell at me and then buy me some drinks and food and yay yes play up the sympathy card we can get drinks (laughs) for the whole team (laughs) well considering originally our plan was to show up and have it be our our wedding party slash honeymoon (sighs) yeah so for anyone from my church who's listening to this broadcast (laughs) my ticket's already booked so i don't think i can double back and book our ticket to our church convention now but I will be there in spirit, and I will most definitely be at the next church convention. So, I'm sorry. It's okay. No, really. It's, I mean, your church can blame me as well. Yes, yes. So, uh, just write all letters, complaints to uh, to Obo Crazy, and Twitter, uh, Twitter dot com slash Obo Crazy, and then you can at Luke McKay, and you can yell at me for not letting him go to RTX because it is my fault. So. I've got a hankering, an idea that I want to run by you guys. Company meeting and all that. Not a live episode of Glib Shark or anything like that. How would you guys feel about doing readings of, of bad fan fiction? Oh, we've done that before. We have. Hell, hell, the very first episode I was on with Linnea Boyev, we read bad fan, fan fiction online. Okay, I'm going to put a clarion call out to our audience here. Uh, if you write a piece of fan fiction, 10 minutes or less... Uh, and send it to, uh, to us. Well, what email address should we use? Do we still have the GlibShark at gmail.com? One? Yes. I don't think it'll matter, but that's fine. We, okay. can, we can make the call. Yeah. Yeah. So send it over. And uh, if it's not, and if we think we can make it work, we'll do a live reading of it right here on the show. Well, listen. I, if you're going to do that, then you've got to go super classic. And at one point, we're going to have to try to read at least a bit of Eye of Argon. Hmm. It's true. I mean, if, if you're going to start talking about reading bad fanfic and, and then it's a drinking game and then we can try to do it, um, we, we could even try to do it live at the, the convention because that's, that's super old school right there. Actually, yeah. So, hey, if you have bad... I don't bad, even know what any of that means. If you have okay. bad fanfiction, like a minute or less, that you want us to read at our panel, come up when we, we ask for questions and hand us a piece of paper and we'll do a quick read of it. Why not? Okay. Eye of Argon, for those that don't know, because I'm old as shit, back in the days of Caves and Fire, uh, there were things called fanzines, which were literally uh, printed pieces of paper that people would gather up together and mail out to people. So the earliest ones were basically science fiction fanzines that some someone would gather up a whole bunch of you know, short stories and fan written content, not official published things and put them together in what was called a fanzine. And then they would get sent out. They were kind of like magazines. That's where the idea came from. Uh, They turned into like uh, a lot of them were um, basically fan fiction. If you've heard of slash and you know that it came from the Kirk slash Spock stuff, that was old, old school fanzines. And so the only way to be kind of in this crowd, and this, this is like back in the 70s, um, so there, there was no such thing as the internet yet. The only way to communicate with other 
nerds and geeks like that was to subscribe to one of these fanzines and you'd pay money and they'd send you just like printed copies of these uh, short stories and, and all kinds of stuff. And there was, um, there was one called The Eye of Argon, which was written by this kid, and I've forgotten his name, that was basically published in one of the, the larger uh, science fiction fanzines that were out there. And it was... Jim Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. That was his name. And it was... Imagine a Conan the Barbarian fanfic written with a thesaurus but no sense of spelling and just like practically incomprehensible in the most eloquently hilarious way possible. And so it, it got published in one of these fanzines and then it turned into this cult thing that would you'd go to a, a science fiction convention and they would essentially put on readings of this thing. So it was, it was getting like shared around. The room of fan fiction. Yes. Or or um uh yeah, I guess the room is probably the closest. It was it was shared around at these conventions as oh my god, you have to read this. And people would copy it and send copies to their friends and be like I can't believe this. I can't believe you you've got to you, you. and and so this cult following came up around this fan this fan fiction, this piece of fiction that it's one of the worst things ever written, but it's like hilarious. And people would read them at conventions, they do like midnight drinking game readings and where, all right, you're going to try to read and you can't just read it straight. You have to try to read it in a, as though you're doing a dramatic reading and you have to do voices and the whole thing. And how long can you go before you just basically dissolve into fits of laughter? Because it's ridiculous. I'm pretty sure we can find a copy online. Um, it's just everywhere. It's, and it's, when you talk about it's not technically fan fiction because it's an original piece of work, but it is so in the spirit of Conan the Barbarian and, and like old so sword and sorcery and um, strong dude running after to help save the princess and that kind of thing that it's just, it is synonymous with bad fanfic. And it is, oh God. I, I, I actually even thought about Eye of Argon in forever, but that's... I think that might be one of the first things that I read online. Wow. That sounds kind of amazing. Like, I feel like, I don't even know if I can copy this or not, but would oh, I'm you guys sure. feel be game to do like a reading of Eye of Argon? Not necessarily at RTX, but at some point in the future on the show? It's long, so you can't do the whole thing. I mean, ah. it, it is, it is oh, I, I'm going to have to look this up now, but it, it's long enough that it's hard to get through the whole thing unless you've got like a couple of hours, especially since you just fall into hysterics pretty quick um oh god it's got its own wikipedia page yeah i'm looking at it right now oh I'm my chapter six might be lend itself to uh <laughs> to uh to a reading or at least part of it oh i just found a transcription oh hello all right i'm, I'm gonna read just the first paragraph for 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 those of you and then i have to go okay so the first paragraph the weather-beaten trail wound ahead into the dust-racked climbs of the barren land which dominates large portions of the Norgolian Empire. Age-worn hoofprints smothered by the sifting sands of time shone dully against the dust-splattered crusts of earth. The tireless sun cast its parching rays of incandescence from overhead halfway through its daily revolution. Small rodents scampered about, occupying themselves in the daily accomplishments of their dismal lives. Dust sprayed over three heaving mounds in blinding clouds while they bore the burdensome cargoes of their struggling overseers. Ugh. Ugh. God, I'm exhausted. That's, <laughs> and you have to have a, a take a second and actually read it because my reading doesn't even begin to, like, do it justice. Oh God! Well, because there's there's spelling weirdnesses in there. There, like, it's amazing. The main character's name is Gringer, G R I G N R. Like, it's 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 an amazing read. It is historical fiction at this point, as far as like if you are a geek and you want to know about the earliest days of geekdom in in the the twentieth century, I have Argon. More like hysterical fiction. 
And that has been your history lesson, if you are a geek. With that, I unfortunately have to go, because fortunately I have to go pick up a friend at the airport. Okay. Bye, Obo. Drive safe. Thank you. I will Bye, see you guys next week. Actually, that dovetails nicely into uh, to the next thing I wanted to uh, address. Uh, basically, the idea that something ridiculously silly is even f- sillier and more funny if read by someone with a reputation for a certain gravitas. Yeah, specifically, I'm thinking of Patrick Stewart. Like, I think I could imagine him doing a dramatic reading of the Eye of Argon. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you heard about this show that he's going to be in. Uh, what's it called? Blunt Talk? Or Blunt, blunt news, Time? Uh, yeah, news to me. Yeah, so basically, I'm mean, the only reason I know about this because I follow someone named Karan Sony who play, who's on Other Space, which is Paul Feig's uh, sci-fi beef, like, B movie level sci fi project on, on Yahoo screen. And apparently, yeah, Karan is playing a character on this uh, show on Stars where Patrick Stewart plays a sort of, uh, you know, talking head kind of uh, think tank uh, or journalist in the mold of a Bill O'Reilly or, uh, or Keith Oberman, that kind of per- over top personality. And behind the scenes is like life is over the top. Uh, he's doing cocaine, he's shooting people. It's just kind of ridiculous. And he has a butler. So, and I think if for any other person it would seem dumb, but because it's Patrick Stewart, you kind of it kind of automatically has a hook. Huh. Agree or disagree? <laughs> Abstain. <laughs> Abstain. What's it called? Blunt something. Blunt. Blunt talk. Yeah, I mean it's stars anyway, so I don't like have the ability to watch it right away, but um. I mean, I guess we've seen that silly Patrick Stewart, Avery Bullock from American Dad, uh, any of his yeah, cameos. Yeah, it's, it's like, uh, it, it, it seems like it's been done. Like, we've already got that in American Dad, which of those Seth MacFarlane shows is probably the one I've watched the most. Just because its non sequiturs are not quite as completely non sequitur. So it, it's a, a little bit more palatable than Family Guy. It's, it's, there's more of a narrative structure to, to American Dad, for sure. Um, everything else was sort of just... I mean, if there's a, a scale of abstraction for Seth MacFarlane. You have his cavalcade of cartoon comedy, which is just nonsense, and then Family Guy, and then the Cleveland show is slightly more realistic, but not by much. And then you have American Dad, where he's not the showrunner anymore, so they were able to give it more of a sort of continuity and backbone. Yeah, I've tried to watch Cleveland show. I just can't. It's not good. I don't blame you. It's, I mean, they try to do something a little different with it, but it's pretty much just Black Family Guy. And he comes off as Seth MacFarlane's sort of love letter to the Black sitcom, but really it just ends up being kind of, I'm not going to say offensive, because that's a, that's a word that keeps calling people to roll their eyes, but kind of just more pantomime than homage, if that makes sense. Although props for casting uh, Kevin Michael Richardson as a, as a hillbilly. I thought that was pretty smart. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but man, television. Or not even television anymore. It's just small screen media. Is there a blanket word for all this stuff now? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I mean, it's, I think television is just going to be one of, those, one of those words that we use for things like this, even though it's not really apt anymore. You mean like how we say film, even though it's not on film anymore? Well, I was going to finish, but Sorry. yes. <laughs> well, I mean, on television or small screen media or what have you, I, I saw an announcement that, uh, that Netflix is hoping to release a Marvel project every six months. Yeah, I saw that. I think that's pretty ambitious, and as long as the quality is good, I, I'm all for it. I, I don't want to get schlock every, twice a year, but sure. if, it's, if it's decent, yeah, sure. Yeah, if it's Daredevil quality or better. Because I know they have Daredevil and then Jessica Jones coming out later this year. And then they're going to do a Daredevil season two sometime next year. Then they still have uh, Luke Cage and Iron Fist. And who knows if they'll do multiple seasons of the three series, depending on how they're received. And that with the introduction of the Punisher, maybe he gets his own series as well. Yeah, maybe. I, I, again, it's... I'm going to be honest. I am so just tired of everything right now. Like I, 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 I don't know. It, 
I'm, I guess I'm waiting for that next big thing. But Ant Man was entertaining enough, and and Trainwreck was all right, and some of the movies that I've seen this summer, probably the best one has been Inside Out, and that that I mean I shouldn't be surprised because it's a Pixar movie and it's an emotional Pixar movie, but I I, I don't know I'm just kind of fatigued right now. I can I can see that. There's a lot coming at us at the same time. And whereas, I guess, 10 years ago, back when none of this stuff was out there, every time anything came out, it was sort of like a realization of a dream come true, something we've been waiting for for our whole lives. And now we're getting everything at once. And we have been for the last, what, decade, 15 years? Yeah, pretty much ever since Phantom Menace. Yeah, maybe you need a nice palate cleansing, just a uh, big dumb action movie with no links to anything. If I want a big dumb action movie, I can go back to what they did in the 90s because they pretty much did big dumb action movies perfectly. And they had, you had stuff that wasn't as family friendly like uh, Last Boy Scout. And then you also have stuff that is a little bit more family friendly. Well, I guess family friendly. I mean, he horribly killed a lot of people. But, uh, but True Lies. Like True Lies is like, more, I, I don't want to say wholesome fun, but I don't know. It, it's, it's just it's 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 sort of violence separated not, from the concepts of violence, cynical. right? It's, it's not as cynical. Yeah, like last act, last Boy Scout is like everything sucks, everyone's terrible, and but it's still at, at its heart a big dumb action movie. Whereas True Lies is a lot more optimistic. Like it's it's brighter, it's shinier. The the Heroes and bad guys are a little bit better defined. And it's, it features a tango Tia Carrere. It does feature a tango in Tia Carrere. I, I love that there are two main, like, high, prominent 90s movies that feature the exact same, uh, I guess, uh, violin song. I forget what it's called. You know, it goes, da na 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 Because Santa Wolfman uses that one, too. Oh, did it? I, I don't even... Yeah. But yeah, I actually see what you're saying. Like I, the '90s was the hallmark, the zenith, if you will, of uh, movies where violence and the consequences of violence were just sort of separated, really kind of blatantly, and even more than they are now. And it was just explosions and kind of A-team level stuff, right? Where things explode and people die, but they're the bad guys, so it's kind of okay. But you don't really see them dying because they they just kind of explode off screen. Yeah. Just limp off. They're like deer that get hit, hit by cars, right? They just limp it, off into the, into the woods to die off screen. But I, feel I, have like a, I have a friend who is really not a fan of more visceral violence. Like, he's okay with stuff like The Matrix where you shoot a guy and he falls over. But, like, you, you reach into a dude's chest and pull out his spine. Uh, yeah, that's, he doesn't deal with that quite as well. See, I feel like there's a violent sweet spot, right? Where if it's not violent enough, um, you know, like it's one of those things where it's like popcorn violence, you know, where it's not really shown. You don't see a lot of blood. You just see explosions and bullets and stuff. A-team level stuff, true lie stuff. You know, that's acceptable to me. And then you have the extreme, over-the-top, gory, bloody violence. You know, Mortal Kombat, uh, any kind of, any Quentin Tarantino movie where it's so, after Kill Bill, where it's just so ridiculously cartoonish and over-the-top that you're removed from it. And then there's that violence in the middle where it's graphic and it's scary. Something like 12 Years a Slave. And mm. it's bo it bothers you because of how real it is. Because it's not so over the... I mean, it is extreme, but it's not cartoonish in its extremity. It's not like, you know, people are walking with their guts hanging out or anything like that. It's just, it hits you and it hurts and you don't want to be there. Yeah, Saving Private Ryan was kind of like that. We actually yeah. had a friend of ours. Uh, I posted a, a downvote video or a downvote gif of that scene in Saving Private Ryan where it was Mellish getting killed. Ooh. And he was just like, I, I can't watch that. That's just too bad. Just the hush part. That's, that's just so messed up. Yeah. Mellish was Adam Goldberg's character, right? Yeah. Okay. It's been a, oh God, 17 years since I've seen it. So... Although, yeah, once in a while, it'll pop up on TV. Like, I see, like, the scenes where he's talking about, you know, Tom Hanks' character about how he's a teacher back home. Spoiler. I, anyone hasn't seen it. We were playing Destiny with, uh, with a few friends of ours. This was, a, this was a while ago. And I've played with them since. So it, it, it's not like they were, they were totally bothered by this. But it was with our good friends, Jules and Steven. And 
I, I kind of was like, I, I kind of went up and stabbed a dude in the back, and I was like, shh. Oh, God. Shh. Not cool, Roadblock. Not cool. <laughs> yeah. There were, Especially, we play, and you play with Steven, too? Yeah. That's twice as messed up. It's not like yeah. I was saying, hey, man, do you remember when that Jewish guy died in, in Saving Private Ryan? Wasn't that great? Hey, well, guess what? It is now. So, nice going there. And Roadblock made it weird. That's what I do. No, no, it's. But I'm super excited to see those guys as well. Uh, I, I'm just really super excited to see everyone. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where uh, movies and uh, everything takes a backseat to uh, to reality, to specifically the reality of our community, of our friends, where these people that we're super tight with that we hardly get to see and, and be in the same room as are going to be in the same room. And that's always a magical time. Yeah, it's like one of those cool team up deals where, where. The uh, let's see who who was it? It was the Time Force Rangers uh, came back to help the. Let's see who was it? The Dino Force Rangers. Yes. And they're showing up and they're comparing notes and 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 oh god, I love I love stuff like that. I love team ups. Yeah. yeah, I mean I can't really say anything. I'm the guy who's gonna gonna reference like a Brave Star Exo Squad like crossover. So. So what can I say? Was there ever a Brave Star Exo Squad? There was not. They were different okay. times. So Brave Star came out like the end of the '80s, and uh, Exo Squad was more early to mid '90s. Right, that's right. And Brave Star was a little more cartoonish. Oh, well, well, they're both cartoons, but over the top kind of. Like, for God's sake, there was a horse that transformed into a anthrop- thirty 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 thirty. I remember thirty thirty. What's thirty? Th- oh, that thirty thirty was his name. The horse. The horse. I don't even remember his name. I just remember yeah. there was Sheriff Bravestar, who, in a in a shocking rare display of eighties PC ness, he is both a cowboy and a native and an Indian. Yeah, so, he was he was a Native American, which is like there were not many of those kinds of characters on TV at all. Nah, so it's sort of like cultural appropriation makes it okay. I, I don't know. Apparently. Well, so, Brave Star is something that comes up from time to time on uh, any podcast Jesse Thorne's on, whether it's uh, Judge John Hodgman or uh, Jesse Jordan Go. And they had Kumail Nanjiani on there not too long ago. And Kumail actually saw it, like, back in Pakistan. And he assumed that Brave Star, because it was on a DVD or tape of uh, American cartoons that they have in, like, a Pakistani like, video store or whatever, he would just go and rent it over and over again, right? And it was just American shows taped onto this di- tape, right? And Kumail assumed that Brave Star was on the same level of G.I. Joe or Transformers. So when he came here, nobody knew what the hell he was talking about because most people don't know about that cartoon. Yeah, even the kids from the, from the late 80s and early 90s don't remember. Yeah, because it was only on for, like, what, a season? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember Sheriff Brave Star. I think it was on – I had a Brave Star lunchbox. I think that was second grade. And then the first two years of high school, elementary school were hard. I had a Willow lunchbox in first grade. So good luck making friends when you have a Willow lunchbox. Second grade was Brave Star. Third grade, I think, was Ninja Turtles. And then fourth grade, I finally had – no, th- third grade was Simpsons. I had a Simpsons lunchbox. So finally I was able to claw my way back from the, uh, the dregs of, uh, of Northeast Philadelphia Catholic school uh, uh, class structure. Yes. I actually had a blast from the past the other day in a in an effort to complete a project for for the panel. I went on Teamspeak yesterday to to kind of talk to some peeps, and I ran into a bunch of old friends, uh, Heather, Giffy, all those Teamspeak guys, and I got to talk to someone I haven't actually talked to in a while, Nereal. Oh, how's she doing? She's doing great, and she's going to be at RTX. Apparently, she was. She was at RTX she, last year. She was. Apparently, she went to Noob's uh, Rooster Speak di- dinner, and we, I didn't even see her. I don't remember seeing her there either, and apparently we talked, but I have, like, no memory of this at all. Prone I've, to blackouts. No, I, <laughs> I did not. I was about to say I didn't get that drunk, but that's not we know better. necessarily true. I just, I have no memory of it at all. And so we were talking about it, and I felt real bad. But you should. Way to leave depression, Nereal. I, I know. So, so we were kind of talking, and I'm like, oh, hey, I have to, I have to run. So I switched channels to, 
to to talk to someone. But before I had left, I was like, "Hey, so do you remember when you were on our show?" She's like, "Oh my god, I do remember when we were on, when I was on your show." And so we were talking about it a little bit, and it's like, "Oh, haha." And there, I'm like, "Well, it's too bad I don't have more time because then I totally get a like a compilation of the times you were on the show and and have that at the panel." But uh, ha, ha, I'd have to go through so many episodes, I wouldn't be able to find it. So I go, and I, I talk to some guys, and I'm like, hey, I need to do this for me. And they're like, cool, I'll do that. I'm like, yay. So I come back to the channel where Nereal was, and she's like, I, there's like hysterical laughter going on. I'm like, uh, what's going on? Apparently, someone had found the episode that she was in. Wow. I believe it. I, if I had to venture a guess, I would say it's late uh, Jenga Jam era, maybe leading up to between episodes 200 and 300. Is that right? I, I have no idea. I oh, they know. didn't tell you what episode it was? No, they didn't. Uh, and I was, like, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, cool. So she said she might call in. I, I don't know if she's going to or not. She's specific time as well. Oh, so, would she be calling into the Jenga Ship account? Or was it, well, I guess you, you'd know if they were calling in. I, I would know, yeah. Right, and then you just drag her into this call. If I could, yeah, but I, I'm not even sure she's going to. But oh, she might okay. be listening, so hi. Yeah. Hello. I, I remember you, Nereal. But she's uh, apparently they're doing some, some cosplay meetup for people who are dressing up like, uh, like Faunus from Ruby. And she is a deer, so I refer to her as, uh, as my dear friend. Very good. Nice to yeah. call back to our BoJack episode. I, exactly. That's, that's pretty much what I was thinking of. By the way, well done on the transition music for that one. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do, 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 do. I was looking for I thought I had the Justice League one as well. Or, no, not Justice League. Super Friends. Su and oh, Super Friends. Yeah. I remember the one from Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends. It goes... Da -da 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 Oh yeah, and it was the two webs like inter in like intersecting or something. Yeah, gosh, you know that is a cartoon that does not hold up well at all. Like I a lot remember of thinking them it was the coolest thing in the world as a kid, but yeah, watching it yeah, twenty plus some years later, 20, thirty almost thirty years later, it's uh, yeah, no, yeah. Very few of those cartoons hold up. It's it's actually kind of amazing that cartoons like uh like. Batman the Animated Series, considering how old it is, is still at, it's still a prime example of, of really, really, really good animation. Because it's, I think it was made, not necessarily with kids in mind. It was toned down so the kids could handle it, but it was definitely something made for all audiences to be able to watch. And they're all like 22-minute short films. They're just masterful. I believe it was the first cartoon that was animated against a black background as opposed to a white background. I believe that is true, yes. Yeah. I still have the DVDs. I think that's something. When, it, when I lost power and I needed something to do, I just p turned on my laptop and popped in uh, Batman the Animated Series DVD and watched the episode, uh, the one where Kirk Langstrom becomes uh, the Man Bat for the first time. Mm -hmm. And apparently there is a Justice League Gods and Monsters movie that recently came out. It came out today. It posits an alternate universe where uh, the Justice League is different people. So... Their version of Batman is actually a Kirk Langstrom who made himself, not make himself into a man bat, made himself into a vampire. Yeah, he's a vampire bat. I did see the, the fight with Harley Quinn, and that was brutal. I haven't like, seen it. Is that, it's just, is it on Netflix or anything like that? Or it's is... on, uh, it, the preview was on like Machinima, okay. and it, it was just the fight between, and it was before like, it, it, they don't let you, like they show Batman. And they kind of let you assume that it's Bruce Wayne. They never actually refer to him as Kurt or anything like that. The only the way you know something's wrong is that he finally he subdues Harley Quinn. He's kind of like holding her by the neck and like holding out her arm. And and she's like, all right, copper, take me to jail. And he's like, jail. And he smiles and he's got fangs and he just he he bites Harley Quinn's neck. And it's and, really brutal. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe the voice actor who plays uh, this version of Batman is Michael C. Hall, a.k.a. Dexter. Maybe. I don't know. Which I think is perfect casting, if true. I know that uh, the, super, the Superman in this universe is General Zod's son, who was raised by Mexican immigrants, uh, immigrant workers, or migrant workers. Hmm. Which is kind of strange, because, okay, he's raised by Mexican migrant workers, but... He is brown, 
But he shouldn't be. He's Kryptonian. He should look pretty much like Superman as far as skin tone. Well, who's the I, mom, I don't, though? What? Who's the mom? I don't, I, whoever General Zod was banging to, I don't, I don't remember. Maybe General Zod was banging. I mean, Krypton's a planet like everywhere, anywhere else, right? You would assume that there are places where the sun, you know, shines more brightly. It's just other. kind of weird that, okay, so, so if that's the case, if Jor-El is white and General Zod is more or less brown, that when they both come to Earth in different universes, they both get matched up with families that look like them. Yeah. I like, mean, what, if, what if General Zod's son had landed in, been the one that landed in Russia? Well, I'm not saying Zod necessarily has to be brown, like brown Kryptonian. He could, be, he could have been with a woman who was a, like a Kryptonian. Well, from... it, do, it doesn't matter. The baby is brown, is what I'm saying. It, do, it doesn't really matter what Zod is. The fact that the brown baby ended up with Mexican migrant workers and the white baby ended up with white farmers in Kansas. Or in that one universe, uh, white farmers in the Ukraine. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. What if the brown baby had landed in the Ukraine? Then what do you say? It's like, uh, I don't know, that's kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, or they could say he's like a gypsy kid. That would explain it right away. Or it could be that maybe the kid's naturally... Maybe, I mean, I don't mean to explain it so much, but like we, we kind of may believe these are kind of hard and fast categories, but maybe it's just something where he just happened to. So Mexican migrant labor, so it was actually in Mexico or it was in the Southwest or what? It was in the Southwest. Like he okay, the so, there's, so there's a possibility the Kryptonians tan really well if they're in the, in the desert. Just yeah, but it's not, per, it's not permanent. It's like even, even I, when you can tell when I've been outside a lot. Sure. Me too. I have this pretty wicked uh, t farmer's tan underneath my wedding ring. It's like, it's uh, considerably like lighter <laughs> underneath there. Yeah, that never goes away. <laughs> Yay, unless I tan with the ring off. Said no one. <laughs> Who's tanning with the ring off? Not this guy. But uh, I, I, That I, I almost get your... could be considered subversive. So what? Who tans the ring off, not this guy? No, just tanning with your ring off. Because it, it implies that you're trying to get rid of your ring tan. Oh, gods of honor. I can see that. It's sort of a badge of honor where even if I, for some reason I forget my ring. Let me take a look at this guy. I've actually even seen that much of the pictures of Superman. Where, okay, he's kind of brown, but he's not like super He's brown. fucking brown. And he's got Is the he? like, he's got the like. He looks um, like the same basic Edward, shade as Wonder, he, as Wonder he, Woman. He, he's got the same like, like potty face that kind of like. Edward James almost has. He looks like a young Edward James Olmos with the uh, acting scars and everything. Oh gosh, maybe he just looks super brown in the, sh in the still compared to uh, to Batman. No, that's he's a pale vampire. That's uh, I. Uh... All right, let me bring up another shot of him. Where this one, he actually looks like super white. DC Comics. Okay. Well, anyway, we're, right, we're so talking about this. This is the yeah, this is Ed this is like the least important conversation we've ever had in our lives. Right. But, uh, but I love that Bruce Timm style of animation. That's something I'm looking forward to watching. You know, the, the broad shoulders and the sort of angular design, like this sort of made famous Justice, Justice League. Yeah, and, and the design for everyone is good. The new Wonder Woman is apparently, like, she's pretty sex crazy. Oh, yeah, I saw the, uh, the still where she's, like, sparring with Steve Trevor or whatever. Yeah. She... No, no man owns her. Yeah, she, she, she spars with them, okay. They're ah. sparring partners. So her deal is that she's Orion's wife or whatever? Yeah, something like that. She's, okay. a, a she's like from Apocalypse. Yeah. Got it. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, I love these Elseworld displays. I think DC's um, alternate universes are more interesting than Marvel's, by and large. Because well, I think Marvel's... You made well, Marvel's are, aren't as developed. I mean, Marvel's... The alternate universe is still pretty much stay in the comics, and anytime you get it on TV, it's just, hey, let's make the cartoon more like the movies. Yeah, and, they, and they've been doing that progressively. Like they had the original Avengers, Earth Mighty, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, and that was just came out after Iron Man, so it had Clark Gregg, and it had. It was basically like Iron Man centric, and then they brought in everyone else. And now they have the Adventures Assemble, which is even more like the movies. It's that's really the extent of Marvel's alternate universes. It's just, hey, yeah. we need to make this more like the movies. I mean, it makes so. sense from a consistent branding standpoint, but you would think that 
that they'd have the freedom now that they've done this for 10 plus years to, uh, to vet, to veer off the path a little bit. Yeah. But although to be fair, like a lot of the most interesting, um, alternate universes revolve around the X-Men, which is a property that Marvel doesn't have. So they, don't, they, they have the, the impetus really, or the motivation to sort of, you know, put money in other people's pockets by developing properties. They don't have the film rights to. It's an argument why they're not releasing a uh, Fantastic Four. Uh, there's no Fantastic Four comic anymore. It's been canceled. And when the Marvel relaunches in October, there's not going to be a Fantastic Four book. Uh, ben Grimm is part of the Guardians of the Galaxy, which I think is kind of cool, actually. Um, the, uh, the Human Torch is part of the Inhumans. Uh, and then I don't know what happens to Fantastic Four, uh, Mr. Fantastic or the Invisible Woman. But that brand, they just decided not to do it. X-Men, they kind of have to print because it sells too well. But Fantastic Four, they just sort of decided we don't have to do with it, this comic anymore as long as we don't have the film rights. It's kind of a dick move. It is, for sure. But it, from a, as a business standpoint, it makes total no, sense. No, I, I, I get that. It's still a dick move. Like, it's, it's just, it's the ugly side of this whole thing because yeah. the, the artists that were, that were invested in Fantastic Four don't get to tell that story anymore. Sure, they're probably off telling other stories. But uh, dick move is all I can really say. Yeah, although to be fair, I can't remember the last time there was a really compelling Fantastic Four story in the comics that I had to read. So the property's kind of been languishing for the last 10 years anyway. Well, anyway, uh, the actually, actually speaking of dick moves, are you familiar with any of the – do you watch Tabletop, right? Yeah. Apparently there was a kerfuffle involving Tabletop and – their misinterpretation of the rules of the games that they were playing. And as a result, a lot of the videos that they show, they're playing the incorrect rules. And they yeah, do... I've seen them just do disclaimers ahead of time on some of the episodes where they're able to catch it. Right. Apparently, it got really bad this last season to the point that Will Wheaton was like, hey, I'm taking it on myself. I, I apologize. We strive for quality, and we haven't delivered that, and I'm sorry. So a week later, he makes another blog post. And he mentions, yeah, we've had all these problems, and it's this producer's fault. It was his job to, to vet these games and make sure that they were being taught properly, and he did not do his job. Basically threw the guy under the bus. And again, I was kind of like, wow, that's a real dick move. I found out something interesting. I have a secondhand connection to this producer that really? was, was, Will Wheaton was referencing. I go to a convention, and I talk about it a lot, BGG.com. Ah. My friends who run that convention, they do a really, really good job. They, they, we sell out just about every year. They are really good about if you are a special guest taking care of you. If you, are, if you have legitimate reasons why, like you have an issue with your tickets or whatever, they'll help out. Apparently, this producer for the last three years has just been kind of showing up to BGG.com. Doesn't buy a ticket, shows up to the convention, goes up to the registration desk, desk and says, hey, I'm a producer on Tabletop. I kind of forgot my ticket. Can I get in? Being that he was a producer on Tabletop, what are my friends supposed to do? Well, of course they let him in. And so he hung out. But he was always kind of a dick. Like, he never was the kind of person that you would want to do favors for. So when I brought this up with my friends, I'm like, hey, did you guys hear about this? And they both groan and say the producer's name, who I didn't know. But they're like, hey, this is that guy, right? And they're like, yeah, this is this guy. So now that he's no longer a producer on Tabletop, they have every reason not to say no to him. him. Yeah. Because he, he's just some guy now. So, poetic justice. I mean, if I'm Will Wheaton, I don't know that I give this guy's, you know, throw him under the bus. I mean, ultimately, I'm responsible for everything that comes out there. But at the same time, if this guy was sort of reneging on his responsibility, where this, this show's job is to sort of show people playing the game, and that hurts the brand, the people who make this game, the people who potentially want to play this game, the audience, hurts the credibility of the show, and then interferes with the good, potentially with the good time that they're having if they're not using the right game mechanic, because... Because the game was designed a certain, with certain rules in mind. And I understand the need to tweak rules, but you need to be able to explain them properly before you deviate from Well, no, you don't even... You, no, and that was never the point to tweak some of these rules. The, specifically why the games for Tabletop were chosen was because they, they were already adapted to the show. Dominion 
one of my favorite games. What we just said, we are not going to play on this show. It is too deep. There's too much going on. Sure. Even though the mechanics are pretty straightforward, there are so many cards and expansions that they couldn't hope to do it justice. Right. Things like Twilight Imperium, Agricola, all those big, meaty games, they're never going to play on tabletop. Yeah. And I can understand that. I mean, they show, what, I think a half hour, 45 minutes, they, they, and they cut like a lot of the, the episodes out, or they, a lot of the playtime out. But there's some games that are just too me- complicated by their mechanic to be able to, to adapt properly. But right. that being said, if it's this producer's job specifically to make sure that these games are being played by the right dynamic, or even the adapted dynamic, then, and if they get it monstrously wrong... And not only that, but they're milking their position to be able to get free favors out of people who are trying to run a con and break even, which isn't an easy thing, as someone who's run a con four years in a row can say. That's, that's a dick move, too. So as Whit- Wheaton was right to throw him under the bus. I, I don't mind that at all. Because yeah, it sounds I, like I, I had everything deserved, got what was coming to him. My opinion about that, because I felt like you did. I'm like, wow, that's kind of a dick move. I don't think he should have done that. Now that I heard about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, he, he, he totally should have done that. Yeah. That, that was stuff that needed doing. And I like that this guy doesn't have a name. He doesn't deserve one. We don't need to give him any attention. I, I don't even has. remember his name. It doesn't Fox. matter. I've decided, you know, this is almost a show decision. I'm not going to celebrate, you know, failures or as humanity. I'm not going to try and give attention to people who are, who are jerks or trolls or anything like that. I want to celebrate people who are doing things that are awesome. Like Nereal. Yeah, exactly. Like Nereal. And like noobs, and like like everyone who comes on the show and talks about stuff. So I think next week we can probably just like a full fledged RTX preview. Just dive all into it, all the stuff we want to do, all the stuff we want to do, and things like that. Absolutely, I'm totally down for it. I am gonna be leaving on Sat- Sunday, so I will be down in Austin. So we may have to. I, I should be. I should have the rig ready, but we'll probably. It'll probably be a minimal rig, and I'll. I'll not sound as awesome as I do right now. That's. I fair. might be. I might be skyping in on my phone, and then, and then like. Uh, I don't know. We'll. We'll figure it out. I may have to piggyback on Xfinity Wi-Fi, but I could probably make it work. Because I'll be moving and all that, and I'm not sure my stuff will be set up by then. But if it isn't, then other people have Wi-Fi. And well, what we'll... you can do, you can just call. I mean, it's on your Skype client. It's it, it, you can do it off your phone. That's true, but again, I, there's sacrifices in sound quality if I do that. But they're not that bad. No. Nah, we'll anyway, we'll figure it out. We're professionals. Don't worry, audience. We'll be here next week. Hey, so our sound producer is Jonathan Serna. I am not nearly as intoxicated as I should be right now. Our announcer is the inimitable voice actor, Bob Ball. Our, hey, hey Jack, ahead. before we go into credits, let's, uh, let's say what, just as a reminder, where are we going to be at RTX? Okay, so Friday, we have our show proper panel. I believe we are, what was it, the let's see, let's RTX? Bring, let's bring it up real quick. You yeah, can, yeah, let's like, give them I'll factual information. So we are really, really excited to be bringing you a lot of entertainment at RTX, and we are very lucky to be able to to continue to do this. It is by the good graces of of Barbara and Gus and all those guys that we continue to have a panel, and yeah. we are very appreciative. And we are appreciative of the people who are going to come out. So thank you, thank you for considering us for your RTX weekend entertainment. Absolutely, thank you very much, everybody. And three. Let's see, J.Y. Marriott in room 301. Looks like we're at 3.30 p.m. That's on Friday. That's Friday. Glib Shark panel, which will just be our regular show talking about our process, maybe debuting a few new things, possibly reading some fan fiction. You know, no big deal. If nothing else, this is the one panel you can get into. I guarantee it. But uh, Saturday, and that's the one I'm excited about too, Saturday evening, we have the Dungeons and Dragons and Drunks. Is that right? Dungeons and Dragons and Drunks. So where is that? I'm looking for this on the program it's here. It's on the Hilton. Oh, here we go. Yeah. yeah, it's in the Hilton room 406. Oh, that's like 7 p.m. on Saturday. Yeah, 7 p.m. Looks like they only gave us an hour. Can we go longer than that, possibly? Probably. There's no one after us. I think it's whenever the Guardians take us out. But uh, uh, we'll, we can, we'll, we'll have it done by then, and it, it, it'll be a lots of fun. It'll okay. be lots of fun. And the return of my uh, Archer character, Sterling Mallory. And we'll be seeing appearance from Jonathan the Magic Muscular. That's, that's correct. He will, be, he will be in force 
and, and, and in full effect. And we have a couple of new players. We have John Sedlak as TBA and, and Jules Rogers as TBA. And I like it. There's a fantastic four. Yeah, right here, that's the real Fantastic Four. Which Hell I suppose yeah. makes uh, Lauren Willie Lumpkin or maybe Wally Winger. I have no idea who either of those people are. That's okay. But, uh, but yeah, RTX, if you see me on the floor, uh, you know, feel free to give me a high five. I will sign stuff for you, or more than likely I will talk to you because my signature on uh, anything but a power attorney, I'm not sure how much that's worth. But I'm happy to, you know, let me know about your panels too. We'll be happy to promote stuff and talk about what you guys are doing. I know there are other podcasters on there, but we're going to have a whole episode about this stuff. Yeah, and, uh, and you can further see me at the uh, Capturing a Community panel on Saturday at 12.30 in the Hilton Room 301. And then at, on Sunday at 11.30, you can see me on the uh, podcast production panel put on by our good friend Joseph Dunlap. And he is go we are going to be talking about podcasting. We're going to have a bunch of guys from from other shows, and I, I'm sorry I don't have it in front of me or here who's, who all is going to be there, but it's going to be awesome, and it is also going to be at the, I want to say the Hilton, uh, and I forget the room. I don't know. I don't have the schedule on me. Oh, it's man, so excited. Something. Kathleen and Yo Mary are doing an autograph signing at booth three on Saturday, and then in booth four as well. Well, that's like nice. that one's going to be Jack Lee and Yo Mary. Yo Mary and I talked about uh, soap operas. I wonder if I can continue that conversation at some point. But anyway... You can follow anyway. us collectively at Glibshark, him at Road underscore Block, me at Jack Edithil, that's E for Edward, D for David, A for Apple, T for Thomas, H for Halo, I for Island, L for Lily, Lauren, who we heard earlier, at Oboe Crazy. And uh, on behalf of Jonathan, Lauren, and the entire Glibshark staff, this is Jack Edithil saying good night, good health, and we should not give up and we should not allow the problem to defeat us. Great dreams of great dreamers are always transcended. Have a good night. Was that from Bernie's quote? No, no, that's uh, Thomas Jefferson. I was quoting APJ Abdul Kalam, the former president of India. He actually came from Tamil Nadu, which is like the state next door from Kerala. And he died recently. And uh, he was the guy who was pre president of India when they became a nuclear state. Ah, yeah, so he's a scientist, and then he was basically untouchable. So he rose to basically from nothing to become the president of this country, which is kind of cool. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and take off. I will see you guys later. Streamers, thank you so much for sticking with us. We will talk to you later. Bye. Bye.